Hello and welcome back to another edition of Porky's Podcast. I am your host, Porky, and with me today is a good friend of mine. Um, Peach Cools has, was it 2,500 hours of esports commentary experience? Oh, geez, it's probably closer to 1,800, um, give, 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 take like two, 300, and I've done other MC or Master of Ceremony events and public speaking and stuff like that. So, yeah, um, I, I certainly know my way around a microphone. He just talks a lot. <laughs> um, so, Peach, give us, give us some background on yourself, man. Um, so I've actually been a chef for close to 16 years now. I started when I was 15, I'm 32. Um, in between that time, I studied at the University of Western Australia, working part-time as a chef whilst I was doing it, doing a Bachelor of Commerce in business law. And then because you have to uh, do what's called broadening units. So you have to do, for example, for Bachelor of Commerce, um, economics, marketing, management, and law. Uh, I found that management really spoke to me as well. So I then decided to do management as a second major. So Bachelor of Commerce, Business Law and Management. Um, I have worked all around WA in terms of being a chef. I've consulted for restaurants in Singapore. I also just uh, finished a brief but very, very harrowing stint on a... um, a cruise ship that's called an expedition ship, and I won't go too much into those reasons, but anyone can look it up. It's called the uh, MS Caledonian Sky. I'm just going to um, jump in real quick. WA, for our American listeners, is Western Australia. Sorry. Yes, so we're... Um, per- Perth is actually the most isolated capital city in the world. It is. And well, where I live the, in Adelaide, yeah. it's like 2,700 kilometres, I think. It's a big drive. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I've, I've actually done that drive as well. Across the Nullarbor? Oh, duh. Yeah. For anyone who kind of uh, hears romantic things about how the Nullarbor is and um, whatnot, it's a lie unless you've got <laughs> a very, very good 4x4 four four or four wheel, what we call a four-wheel drive in Australia for the Australian listeners. Um And if you've got a four-wheel drive camper attachment, uh, then yes, you can have a lot of fun on there. But if you're just hounding it across, trying to get across there as quickly as possible, um, well, if you have to do it, you have to do it. But I'd certainly not uh, recommend doing it for a, um, oh, yeah, we'll we'll spend seven days going Perth to Adelaide Uh, because you will end up averaging something along the lines of at least – and – the number that you quoted as well is actually the shortest distance. Um, myself and my ex who lives in Adelaide as well, um, we we did kind of an elongated version. So we went all down from the south, like we went from Perth down along the south coast and wrapped all the way up to a place called Esperance. Then we went north to meet the Erie Highway, which is a highway that then takes you across the Nullarbor Plains. Yeah. And so that in total was about 3.4 or 3.5 thousand kilometres. And I think I managed to bash that out. Um, aside from a place where we stopped for two days, I pretty much bashed that out in about five days. So I was doing Ugh. 700 kilometres of uh, driving a day. Yuck. But yeah, um, so... Uh, after business law and management, I also have got some experience in the real estate industry. I started off as a customer relations person for a company called Niche Living. Uh, a lot of respect for those guys and what they do there. I uh, And customer relations is simply going, if you click on an ad on Facebook, don't click on the ads, by the way, um, <laughs> and, it's, and, and it says, oh, yes, to view this, you need to give the information that Facebook has to these people. And so you'll then get a phone call from me going, hey, Barry, it's Penny here from Niche Living. I saw that you were interested in having a bit of a look through our designs and plans. Now, look, I understand that we've got over about 80 plans for 12 different locations and around 600 houses that are for sale at the moment. Look, I'm not here to sell you anything, but what can I help you with? What can I guide your search with? I'm not here to sell you something, but I'm here to sell you on something. See, but see, that's the thing. I actually yeah. was so good at doing that that after about three months, 
I was then promoted to head of customer relations, which was a position that they made for me. It was it previously customer relations just was um, integrated in the sales team, and because of how good I was, they were like, you know what, you're head of customer relations, you can train the new people, you can you can now be the one who wrangles all the what was called internally the lead generators. So a lead is someone who clicks on an ad, clicks on a link, whatever it may be, even brings up on a very, very rare occasion. Um, and we then get them talking. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, did that. Then I was so good at that that I um, pretty much pushed my way into uh, getting them uh, – to pay for my real estate license and, and training, which is about nine grand or so. So big ups to them as well. Um, and then all through this at some stage, uh, my ex of six years broke up with me. Cool. And um, I, I really have to give Niche Living a lot of credit because they kept me on for about six mon- months after that. And like my, my head just was not in the game. My heart wasn't there. I was, I was a broken, broken man. And that then brings us to kind of a few years ago where I was, I, I had uh, been asked to resign at niche living. Um, so I moved out of my, uh, quite expensive apartment for Perth standards, which would have been around 16 grand a month because I know for the American viewers, they like doing all their rents monthly, which is weird, but $400 um, Australian uh, a week. And that was in a place called South Perth. So just outside of the city. Um, And I was essentially living at a mate's place who, um, because I'd already been, always been a gamer, I kind of went, you know what? I've got a decent headset microphone, which, as you can see, I don't use a headset microphone anymore. I've actually invested a little bit more as well. Um, And uh, and I started going, you know, I'll I'll be a live streamer. So the first game that I actually live streamed for very, very little effect was Apex Legends. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah. I did did that for two, three hundred hours. Um, And then I I wouldn't call him a mate because... Well, oh, he's a good dude, but he's certainly um, very, very dodgy. And um, rightly or wrongly, he was convicted for, um, I think it ended up being GBH, so grievous bodily harm, because someone had a run at his brother. And then when he saw this guy next, he flogged the absolute shit out of him. Um, but I think it was after he had um, gotten out of jail, he turned around to me and said, well, you're doing this live streaming thing, mate. Like, why don't you, why don't you go and volunteer to be a caster, an esports commentator for this local um, uh, LAN event, which is actually one of the largest um, uh, LAN events in uh, the Southern Hemisphere. It normally has about 400 uh, participants all bringing their own computers. Oh. So that's called, that's called RF LAN or Red Flag LAN Fest. Um, if anyone is interested to look into that, that is rflan.org. Um, and if you're in WA, if you're ever thinking of joining uh, or visiting, I should say, um, maybe tee it up that you come down and you have a look at it because for for viewers or for spectators, it's completely three. You can can just walk through, have a look. It's normally two gymnasiums that they rent out from a university and they put in all the network infrastructure that they need. They get even a sponsorship from, I can't remember who it is, but it's essentially like a research organisation that provides ultra high high speed internet for universities. Um, So when I typed in speed test, uh, there's no point in me pulling it up on my screen because I know this is just a recording, but it was something along the lines of um, it was hitting like 2,670 something um, uh, MBS a second. Oh my God. Um, and, and the only reason why it wasn't actually going higher is because I didn't have a, um, 
a port capable of actually doing that. <laughs> but 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 one of the computers that has a, uh, if anyone has heard of it, a Ryzen Threadripper, absolute beast mode of a CPU. It's got something like thirty two or twenty eight cores. It is, it is. Uh, internet is seriousbusiness.com.au or just .com. Um, uh, this this guy uh, had a had a terabyte um, Ethernet port or something like that, and I just I just like the numbers just kind of were on the screen, and I just went, yeah, shit, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's how I started my casting career. I um, was meant to do Tekken. Because I've always been a massive Tekken fan, even though I have played a fair bit of PUBG, and uh, the Tekken tournament got cancelled, so I then actually went and did um, uh, the PUBG tournament instead. And one of the um, uh, winners was a guy who goes by the name in the um, Australian pro and semi-pro stream uh, scene as Annan, um, and. Uh, he turned around to me at the end of a competition when I came up to him and shook his hand and congratulated him. He was like, Hey man, I've, I've never seen you around. Like you're really, really good. Like how long have you been doing this for? I, I actually, I don't know if he even asked me that, but I pretty much said, Oh yeah, you haven't seen me around because this is my first time. <laughs> and he just went, yeah. uh, what? And, and then he got me in touch with a lovely group, um, called the, well, just the, premium or the oceanic premium scrims uh scene over here who do all of the scrimmages for the professional and semi-professional teams when mm -hmm. there's no competitions going and i did a thousand 1.2 1.3 000 hours of that uh just kind of uh wetting my tongue getting used to speaking into a microphone and yeah. doing all the intonation and rattling off calls and shots and tactics and stuff like that yeah so, um, you mentioned you've done all this casting. How much of the game do you actually need to know? Do you need to be an expert or does an intermediary, intermediary knowledge kind of suffice? Well, look, the more that you know of the game, the easier it is going to be for you to transition into higher quality casting. Like I'd played PUBG, for example, for about seven or 800 hours, but I'd never played competitively. I'd only really played ever like with a few mates kind of playing quads and my understanding of the game was completely different from what a competitive uh side of the game is but in say like so it will always help you like if you're a semi pro or if you've at least tried um to to play it professionally for like even a season or two then it would probably give you a at least a bit more of an in-depth knowledge to start off with because you're already researching and looking up at how teams operate, how teams move around. Some teams either pay or um, are just lucky enough to have one of the pro players who will coach them a little bit for X amount of hours a week. Um, and so they've already got that inside knowledge of when you're, when you're casting, you're – you're trying to either hypothesize or communicate to the viewers what is going on. And you're trying to, you're not trying to treat the viewers as idiots, but you're also trying to, uh, like the way I got described to it, rightly or wrongly, but I do like the analogy is imagine they aren't able to actually see, like it's a radio broadcast. It's, it's not in front of them. So you need to be able to say that they're flanking up the high ground on the left and they're taking shots while two elements of the team are moving in from X and Y direction using cover, using smoke, blah, 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 to pincer X, Y, and Z players from another team. Oh, no, you've then got a third... You've got oh. a... Yeah, thing I died, dude. Um, yeah, I've just pressed space. We're back. <laughs> um, yours never came up, but it's fine. Um as as I said, so used to just talking to a screen. Yeah, I think it's because um, I think it's because my webcam is being streamed through OBS. It's being kind of papaga. Ah, uh, yep. Yeah. Um. So yeah, like you've got all of those considerations as to 
how, yes, like the more you play the game, the better it will be if you are going to try and cast it. You do also need to be relatively uh, eloquent with your words and yeah. not having to always say ah um, more ah. Uh. If you don't have anything to say, either slow down how fast you are speaking or don't say anything at all. Mm-hmm. Now, when I've done professional casts, I have been lucky that after a few days, the organizers went, Peach, you're doing a really, really good job. But, but by, the end, by the end of the night, we can hear that you're flagging. Like after, after like five or six games, like you are rooted, my guy. And I'm like, yeah, I am because I've literally been speaking like I am to you now, but sometimes a lot faster as well for close to three hours. Yeah. Um, it is a marathon. And in saying that there are sprinting parts in that mar- marathon. You want to work on getting what I call tempo. So... At the start of a match, you're not speaking all too excitedly, all too fast. But then when a good fight might break out, then you kind of kick it into high gear. But then as you get closer and closer to the end, you start trying to add more and more tempo. Yeah. Yeah. See, just to, just to personalise this, um, when I casted Kings of the Seas with Sherpa, I found that um, the first... He's drinking um, health food, guys. It's orange juice in a Grant's bottle. <laughs> they can't um, see my uh, my webcam, can they? Yeah. Oh snap! Oh snap! <laughs> it's fine. I thought I thought you were just having it so that you had someone to no. talk to as well. I'm like, <laughs> Peach did none of the homework I gave him either. I was like, yeah, check out the cup, check out the other couple of I've done. Then you can come on and you got an idea. No, none of that. Uh, dude, you, ne- you never sent me any of the links. <laughs> Didn't I? Rip. Nope. You can tell who's, subs- who's not subscribed. By the way, subscribe to me. Do it. Um, yeah. Just to personalise this, I, I cast Kings of Seas with Sherpa. And um, start of the game, start of the day, I was so excited, hyped. And by the end of it, I'm just like, oh, I really don't care anymore. I honestly don't care who wins. I don't care what happens. Marathon. Dude, it was suffering. Five hours of me getting super excited. Oh my God, look, he's pushing through with the Citadel. And I just don't care anymore. Yeah, see, that's, that's where from like, my point of view, the fit, like, especially if it's early game and you know that if, 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 it's, if it's just a knockout ladder where they've only got one game to prove themselves, then you always save the excitement for if it's potentially going to be a clutch. Yeah. Otherwise, some games, unfortunately... They're just not going to be that exciting. You're mm-hmm. you're going to you're going to be pushing shit uphill, and if you're like I don't, you're like people are watching, going, mate, <laughs> like literally, lit- like what are you doing? Yeah, their carrier was the was. Did King of the Sea have carriers? No, no carriers have been blackballed. Oh really? Yeah. Because the entire community is like, no, please, no, no, please, no. Yeah, well, I mean, Sucks. I was a carrier main when I played it, but it is what it is. I, I feel, I feel like there should be, and I think I've said this to you, but I feel like there should be something of a modifier where if you're caught out of position or you're by yourself, yeah, a carry should easily run rampant over you. But if you're, let's say, next to another ship. And some ships might have different multipliers, but let's say you're next to a cruiser. And some cruisers might have different multipliers on top of that. But if you're next to a cruiser, not only um, will that cruiser being in proximity to you boost the cruiser's own um, AA by, let's say, 1.2 times, it boosts yours as well. Yeah, so well, I mean, so the, you've kind of got this stacking effect where like AA envelopes or AA umbrellas are a thing. And yes, in that case, you need to play a much more tactical game of how do we separate these, um, these ships so that our carrier can do something other than just 
loiter around and give recon. I mean, recon's a great thing as well. Um, but they could also then balance that by going, yeah, okay, I know it's not exactly... Well, no, it, I, I think they actually have... They, they have nerfed, like, the torpedo range because torpedo ranges normally go up to about 20 or 30 kilometres as a base. Like, there wasn't that much disparity between, let's say, Japanese and British torpedoes. But to make the game more interesting, they did have a little bit of creative influence. I don't see why they couldn't just go, you know what, your planes are going to get shredded if you get close. Doesn't mean that you can't sit back and lob a few sets of torpedoes from 10 or 15 kilometres away. And you know what? If you hit, you're a damn, damn good shot because your, to your torpedoes are probably running slower as well because that would just be the game mechanics. You've got so many things that they could do to make carriers less of a thorn in people's sides and more of a viable play style because I, I really did enjoy it. Well, the big um, the big gripe with carriers in the competitive scene is their ability to spot. All right, it completely removes. Um, Sherpa put it brilliantly. It removes the fog of war in any competitive game. You know, you look at Age of Empires, Starcraft. The fog of war has always been a massive thing, and with an aircraft carrier, it kind of just eliminates that. Yeah. You're not going to have surprise off pushes. You know what I mean? You're not going to have surprise yeah. offside pushes. I mean, but that's also if you've got a good um, aircraft carrier doing its job. The other, the other way that you can also, again, like you can maybe not nerf the planes, but you can buff the ships. All of a sudden, a battleship's detection range isn't 15 kilometres by air. It might be 15 kilometres by sea for whatever reason. Yeah, it might not make sense really on paper, <laughs> but you could always drop it down to eight for yeah. example. And so, and also like if you are playing with carriers in there, there are some really nasty destroyers. Like I think it's a Halland. Like if you play a Halland and also, am I allowed to say the F word on here or do you want, yeah, want me go to? go for it. Um, just, if just, you play just, that, don't, just don't like every other word. Just just be less yeah, Australian, no, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, think <laughs> I've been, I think I've been pretty good, but I do really also good. want to push the point. Um, but if you play a Halland, fuck you to the moon. Oh, here we go. Like, I'm just... going to get 100 Halland players. Excuse me, what did you say about me? <laughs> oh, no, no. It is, it is a great ship. No, it's but tremendous. Couple, coupled with its AA capabilities and its concealment, you pr like, you're pretty much uh, just dead on top of them by yeah. the time you detect them. And you're like, oh, half a squadron of mine has gone. Yeah. Un un unless you're the FDR. But, I mean, like yeah, the, FD yeah. the FDR does, it's got less potential damage output, if I remember correctly, unless they've no. changed that. But it does have a much, much higher um, health pool on its planes. So you can pretty much guarantee that every single bombing run you're going to do, you can take the time to do it properly. Whereas with most other CVs, you want to try and line that up, drop that, Return to carrier as fast as possible because otherwise you're just going to be deplaned. See, the thing with the FDR is the Hakuryu, which is the best tier 10 CV, don't, no, no one try and DM me in chats, don't at me. The Hakuryu is a, it's a, it's a scalpel. It's precision, it's fast, it's speed, it's power, it's efficiency. The FDR is a battering ram. <laughs> it is. Um, it, it's, it's got mega, mega alpha strike, and the plane health is second to none. 54k HP on the bombers. Uh, yeah. I've, I've, got a, I've got a good saying for that. Mm. Strong like ox. Smart like a dump truck. Yeah. Pretty well. FDR is just a carrier on easy mode. It's, it's one of those carriers it's hard to be excellent at, but it's really not hard to be middle of the pack. Yeah. Yeah, like even when I was doing really good um, with my uh, mid, uh, midway, geez, I haven't, I haven't played for probably about seven or eight months. Um, yeah, midway is the tier 10. Correct. Lexington, midway, and then you've got some other little scab. Um, but yeah, so like your, your midway, like 
I always felt really good when I could have more damage and more kills and stuff like that than an FDR on the other side. I'm like, ha ha, <laughs> you are a shitty CV player, sir. Well, the thing is, right, the, the FDR is just, an, is just a midway on crack. Yeah, well, no, it's basically. a midway on roids. Yeah. It, it, it feels no pain. It big, bulky. It likes to lift heavy things and it's off time. <laughs> but no, I mean, midway is just a faster, less damage output um, FDR. You can, you can be more efficient in a midway. Mm. And I mean, efficiency is the, the best quality to have in a carrier player. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, so, like, I, I don't know. There's, there's, there's a lot of things that I would have liked to see, but I know that because so many people were just complaining about CVs, I think the war gaming has just kind of taken a step back and they're like, oh, we're not really going to do much with them from the competitive side, um, which, which I do think is a bit of a, it's a bit, it's a bit sad because, there is a real um, niche for potentially like 12 v 12 competitive where like especially on larger maps, like when you're playing 12 v 12 like that, it reminds me a bit of Battlefield 2. Like I, I, I used to play Battlefield 2 and we used to do, we used to do 16 v 16 and 32 v 32. Oh my God. Um. Uh, competitions and I actually used to be I um, for the 32s I used to be the commander so if, if anyone has played Battlefield 2 you, you understand what I'm saying if, if you haven't then the commander literally has got a, a map screen where you can see all of your squads and what they're doing you can set them waypoints go here do this you can assist them by spotting uh, individual players or putting a UAV down every so often that loiters around the battlefield for 30 seconds or so. Um, but it only reveals... A, the UAV isn't like a UAV in COD where the UAV reveals everything on the map. It is a area restricted. Mm. So you need to then, as a commander, weigh up, am I going to give the UAV to these guys or am I going to give a UAV to the front line? Because these the, these guys, the guys who are flanking, playing sneaky, sneaky, trying to go all the way around, and pretty much what you call back cap, because then you can have other people spawning at that cap as well. Yeah. So it like it is interesting for me from the logistical side of things. Going okay, so in in a twelve v twelve, for example then yes, I think a carrier would be a, a good choice to be allowed into it because with some of the, like, with the large maps that you play on matchmaking, as a carrier main, I get infuriated when people are like, oh, I've got no support over here. I'm like, do you not understand that I can only have one set of planes going at once? Yeah. It's not RTS carriers, guys. Yeah. <laughs> um. Like, and so I, I think that, yes, carriers maybe for la larger engagements would be quite interesting to see. Whether or not they do that, whether or not they think that they've got the population um, for their servers or for the teams to actually be able to field mm. a 12-man um, is completely different. And I, and I feel like anyone listening to this who has played um, competition, because I have done clan battles as well, um, they might just be sitting going, no, no, it's, it's, it's too much hassle. Well, I mean, look, once upon a time you could have 40-man raids in World of Warcraft. <laughs> I'm just going to drop the mic there on this subject. Yeah, I mean, the, the big thing is, I don't think in Kings of the Sea we'll ever get carriers again because the, the, the popularity is just not there. And what I mean by popularity, mm. not the health of the number of people playing, but it's the number of people that are just anti carriers it'll never that it'll never happen i would yeah. froth i would love it i know several people that would detest it and, and i understand yeah. right I, I get it it's a shot caller's nightmare a carrier is basically one extra damage source on either side of the map well that's where the shot caller would normally probably actually be playing as a carrier nah so, sh shot calling in a carrier is a nightmare dude it's yeah nightmare. no but that's what that's that's what i'm saying you'd you'd probably have 
um, I, I'm saying like you'd kind of be commanding the overall strategy of what you're going to be doing, depending on what you see with your planes. And then you'd have, let's say, just two teams, so two, like one of six, one of five, um, and then like you'd pretty much have two squad leaders, um, yeah. more nursing and micromanaging the situation from there. Mm-hmm. Well, because we are a World of Warships podcast primarily, let's talk a little bit about World of Warships. What oh, do you geez, think? As I said, I haven't, haven't played yeah. in about seven months. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. What do you think that World of Warships needs to do to be classified as a viable eSport? Um, well, make all... make And again, like, I'm sorry to kind of beat the drum again, but make all ship classes viable for um, competitive, which means they need to find a way. I'm not saying as carriers are now, yeah. and I'm not saying as ships are now. I did touch on detection ranges. I did touch on uh, potential AA uh, multipliers for ships being close enough together, stuff like that. Um, I don't know if they've ever played around with it. I don't know if that's something that they've even considered. I wouldn't consider myself a visionary, but maybe no one's just suggested it to them. Um, but something like that, you need, like, for, for esports to be viable in a game, you don't really see StarCraft being like, oh, no, you can't build roaches or, or Warcraft 3 going, oh, you, you can't recruit this hero from a tavern. Um, yeah. you, you, you need to have the level of balance there where people are going to be attracted to the game because of an eSports scene. Mm-hmm. And, I feel, and I feel like um, like Warcraft 3, aside from Blizzard's current... Uh, dirtying the bed they could have done so much more but it was a great game and, and it should have had a much stronger resurgence but Warcraft 3, Starcraft 2 both great um, uh, examples of where you do have multiple factions so multiple ships, multiple trees, multiple countries doing all yeah. different things um, being able to actually be balanced against each other mm-hmm. and the, I mean, the other downside with World of Warships is it's not necessarily um, pay to win, but it is definitely pay to stop grinding as much. <laughs> it's pay to experience the best. Yeah. And the other problem is, is because they have set the bar and the cost so high to get certain ships and certain ship tiers, the problem that you will always find is that you like if you were to go you know we'll make it more accessible for everyone we will make it let's say 80 bucks for a introductory pack essentially about the amount of money that most australians pay for a brand new game um yeah that that's about that, a triple a title yeah and 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 that will give you um uh and, and you know what they might even go you know what we will give you this after you've played five hours in the game so you understand the concepts so you don't waste the purchase of two tier 10 bat uh, two tier 10 ships and you're like i just want to play battleships so you buy two battleships and you're like oh i actually like destroyers now yeah um alternatively they go you know what within the first month of you owning the game and purchasing the ships you can refund them and get another one. However, the timer starts from when you made that first purchase. So you've got 30 days. You, you can refund it as many times as you want in 30 days to get a play of any other tier 10 ship that you want. But after that, like you might log in and it might go, what ship do you want? Because we're locking you into this ship unless you want to pay 30 or $40 for a different ship. But I mean, I, I haven't looked at the prices recently and I can't remember them, but I'm pretty sure like some of the tier tens are pretty freaking dear. Well, I mean, you can't actually buy tier tens. You can buy, well, there's a, there's a tier 10 in the store at the moment, which kind of undercuts what I'm saying, but you can't just go buy the Yamato for say, you know, you can, Ooh. you can buy, doubloons and shit to uh, convert XP, but you still need to earn that XP. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's about 103 bucks for a tier 9 premium. That's But that's what I'm getting at. Like, 
$103. Yep. Like that, like, but again, how do they change that um, without angering the community who has already potentially paid money if they drop their prices? The only way they can do, the only way they can do that is by kind of looking at how much someone has potentially um, uh, bought and, and giving them, let's say, store credit, for oh, example. Go, go, going, look, you know, we, we've dropped the price by um, the tier nine buy $40 to make it more accessible for everyone. Mm -hmm. You're going to, you're going to get 40 bucks worth of doubloons even. Yeah. Um, but, but finding a way to obviously reimburse the people who have already invested in the game, but lowering the bar of entry for other people. Yeah. Because $103, that is freaking ridiculous. It is. That's 103 frozen Cokes from McDonald's, by the way, guys. Yeah. About um, well, that's that's like freaking fifty one and a half cheese, uh, uh, double beef and cheeses or something. Jesus, homeboy spends a lot of time at Mac, as you can tell. <laughs> Actually, I got a funny story yeah, on that. I got yeah, I got a funny story on that. I worked at McDonald's for years. We had a guy come in, and he get he goes to me. He goes, I said, "Oh, how are you, man?" He goes, "Yeah, good." Um. Can I have 83 cheeseburgers? I looked him up and down and went, you want 83 cheeseburgers? He goes, yeah, 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 83 cheeseburgers. And can I have some, uh, can I have two 20 packs of nuggets? And I was like, all right, I got to go get my manager here. If I approve this and you're an idiot, I'm going to look like a dick. <laughs> so anyway, we get the 83 cheeseburgers and like was it 60, 60 chicken McNuggets. All on the tray. I walk out to him. He takes a photo and says, thank you. That's gone on Facebook. That's oh, it. And you're like, yeah. he's just like, he's like, I'm out. I'm done. Like just leaves the cheeseburgers. No, nah, he grabs the whole thing, gets in his car and pisses off. I'm just like, this is the most, this is the weirdest experience I've, in my life. I, Fair enough. I don't even know what happened. I remember when I was a lot younger, um, uh, me and my mate would spend like 24 hours at a land cafe. Um, and we'd just be so um, revved up on caffeine and, like, we'd just be drinking Cokes throughout the night and throughout the day that, like, we wouldn't really eat. And then at some stage we'd be like, oh, I'm feeling pretty rubbish right now. And so they'd be like, Maccas? Maccas. Um, and he, he'd be like, yeah, can I get a double quarter pounder with, like, three extra meat and eight extra cheese? And I was like... <laughs> That. So you're a streamer now. How cool is that? Yeah, you um, do the thing. I haven't haven't been doing it for well since I got back off the ship. That was a uh, 56 days straight of um of 14 hour days. Ugh. Um, and and also like because you're on your feet as a chef for so long, um, like by the time you get home. Even though you were dog tired, you're actually in a fair bit of pain. Like your your joints are aching, um, everything is sore. You've probably collected an extra burn or something. Even though I was pretty good at actually not burning myself because I'm not special. Um, and uh, and yeah, like you, it would it would take you two or three hours to kind of de-stress, unwind, have a shower before you can get to sleep. So by by that stage, it's like, let's say, one in the morning and you have to be up by pretty much five. Ugh. So like you eat, like the only things that you do on your days off, um, if you just work normally as a chef, is, is kind of sleep. Um, but yeah, on, on the ship, it was terrible because the, the, the accommodation was legitimately designed for, um, for Filipinos and Indonesians and, and, um, both of those two from a kind of biological cross section 
they are shorter and smaller people. <laughs> I am I am six foot two. My head would touch the wall, and my feet, if I pointed them, would touch the other wall where my <laughs> where my bunk was encased in. <laughs> right, and I I've got quite broad shoulders. Like if I had one shoulder against the wall, I'd probably have less than 10 centimetres, so about three and a half to four inches of bed on the other side. Oh, my goodness. So not only was I working very, very long hours, I wasn't getting enough sleep because the actual bunk size was just disproportionate to what I needed. Yeah. Yeah, so do you have plans to start streaming again or are you just... What's the yeah, plan, man? Definitely definitely have t- uh, plans to start streaming again. I am... Um, well, today I was meant to um, actually put in a whole heap of job applications for some FIFO slash Mindsight work, but for whatever reason, I could not sleep a wink um, last night. I, pr- I probably put it down to uh, nerves a little bit, to be honest. I've got a... Um, got a date this evening i'm cooking this uh this beautiful lovely smart etc etc girl um dinner and so probably a little bit of nerves i'm also now on nicotine patches um, oh here we go so uh yeah first first day um or I, I put it on yesterday and i have a feeling it might have been the nicotine patch that was kind of keeping me up as well um so, yeah, I uh, was meant to be looking for jobs today, but that <laughs> really didn't happen. Yeah. Do you feel... But, um, Sorry? Go. Do you feel streaming is practice for commentary? Also, have, has streaming helped your commentary? Um, yes and no. I don't feel strongly that it kind of helps the commentary side of things. Um, just because you're, you're, you're doing a different thing. Like people aren't always wanting to tune in and just have something so high energy. They're wanting to kind of look a lot of the time when I tune into, um, someone it's because I want to decompress. Mm-hmm. I want to, I want to, um, I, w- I want to start even potentially getting ready for bed or I'm already in bed and I'm just looking at it on my phone. Yeah. Um, Obviously, there are different types of streaming, and I, I I do a bit of game playthroughs and stuff like that. So that's also different. Like if you're wanting to learn a bit more about a game or something, you might tune in, or you you've heard about a new um, game coming out. Like I I did play a fair bit of companies of uh, Company of Heroes three um, on the uh, open alpha. That's now just closed a few days ago. Oh, I'm so really, excited for that. Really, really cool concept. Um, yes, I could have streamed it, but I just I didn't really have the mental capacity. Like I've just been so um, burnt out by working close to two months um, in a row, and easily averaging. Um, like a hundred hour weeks, if, if not like more, um, like you, you, you hear about like nurses and doctors on, on emergency room rotations and stuff like that doing a hundred hour weeks, but they then will get some downtime at some stage. They'll mm. get a few days off. Um, whereas for me, like I was on the boat, boom. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Um, and I say 14 hours average because there were a few times where I was doing 16 or 17 hour days. Oh my goodness. Um, That's actually ridiculous. Oh, look, uh, if, if you're shorter than me, great experience, great crew, great ship, really cool concept. We do amazing food in some of the most remote places in the world because the what's called the Kimberley Coast, which is a coastline of the north edge of Western Australia, is some of the most um, desolate and remote in terms of population 
uh, anywhere in the world. Like mm -hmm. you've you've got areas of that coastline where the only population you might actually come across is either another small sailing ship or, or leisure craft, um, or there might be an Aboriginal community of 40 or 50 um, people. And that's the only thing for a few hundred kilometres either up and down the coast or like a few hundred kilometres into the coast as well. Yeah. So, like, you are really, like, you don't want that ship to sink, that's for sure. Oh, no. That sounds, like pretty important keep the thing yeah. above water right yes. that that's that's how they work isn't it <laughs> yeah i mean one of um one of my favorite um officers on board a guy called harkin who's uh who's who's the first officer so he's he's second in charge behind the captain um when i got a chance to um be on the bridge and ask him a few questions like because i'm quite engineering minded I asked him, oh, yeah, so, like, what's the fuel consumption, blah, 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 blah. And he just looks at me and he goes, I don't know about that. All I know is I go like this. Ship goes forward. I go like this. Ship goes back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but lovely guy, super professional as well. Um, like, there's, there's also, like, you also had the second officer, um, Richard, who we, you just call him safety because the second officer's main role is the safety officer. Yeah. Now the, the captain, the first officer and the second officer, as well as I think a few others on board actually had their master's certificate, which essentially means that they could captain the ship. Mm -hmm. Um, for whatever reason, um, they were just in the positions that were, that they were in. Yeah. Um, but like the... The officers and the Filipino crew, just so, so professional and so brilliant, like just hardworking and kind to a T. I still, I still chat probably more to some of the Filipino staff and, and, uh, and officers than I do any of the Australian or New Zealand crew on there. Yeah, um, all of the Filipino people, they're just wonderful people. They're always smiling, always really polite. Oh, but do not get on their bad side. No, but they're fantastic people. Like, <sighs> if I was to go anywhere in the world and live, it'd, it'd probably be the Philippines. They're just tremendously good people. Hey, he's killed his webcam just so he can just so he can sneak a drink. Oh, that's you. That's clever, you. I'm on to you. <laughs> it's fine, man. This is this is purposely not made for kids. Yeah, I know, but in saying that, drinking out of the bottle is not exactly a classy look for yeah. a um, once professional esports caster. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the rise and fall of Pitchicles. Oh, how the mighty have fallen! <laughs> and just and just and just wait till I get back on that horse again. <laughs> uh, for, it's first five o'clock is... somewhere. Hey, it's four fifteen here. Yeah, it's it's only fine. Six o'clock here. <laughs> Um, just before I let you go, do you have any projects on the go, man? Um, at the moment, not really. I was, um, I was wanting to use a lot of the money that I actually, uh, earned from being on the ship and getting pretty good overtime to probably dropping about 10 grand into a new computer. But then I had a whole heap of, um, maintenance stuff around my apartment I had to pay mortgage and also make sure that I've got mortgage set aside for the next few months and yeah. heaps of other stuff. So the the money that I had kind of dwindled into my reserves and I went, yeah, okay, like it's it's going to have to be put on hold because mm -hmm. even though I do have quite a decent rig, um, I'm finding that especially the new games, I'm not able to play um, – with super high fidelity and really good frame rates, especially if I'm streaming, because I have got one computer for that. So the goal the goal is is before I really really refocus on streaming would be to have a good like ten or so grand in savings aside from uh, purchasing the computer, so I can throw myself into that properly. 
also just working on a better work-life balance, mm -hmm. um, going back to karate, going back to table tennis, going to the gym. Um, like it, it, if, if people really want to find my Instagram, they can. It's not hidden by any means, but like you see some photos of me there, like even two years ago before I was such a dirty alcoholic, um, I was, I was fine. I, I was, I was damn fit back then. Um, so, so getting back to that for my mental health whilst I'm doing the, uh, the casting and, and the streaming, I think is, is my number one priority. As, as soon as I know what job I've got, and what um, swings I'm going to be doing, like two and one, three and one, then I think I'll probably start going back into streaming because then I can at least let my viewers and listeners know what I'm doing instead of just being sporadic. Yeah. Well, man, um, link will be in the description for Peach's Twitch. Do you have any, uh, do you have any, any YouTube, anything like that? Um, YouTube is non-existent. Uh, give me a sec. Like for anyone who's actually, um, I've, one of my screens is actually turned the opposite way. So I'm trying to kind of fish a <laughs> screen. I'm trying to fish a screen without actually, you know what? New window. Where's, where's, oh, God damn it. Screen really. Yeah. Just, um, just DM me some links and I'll throw them in the description. Go check him out guys. Please follow him on Twitch. Also, I do the thing. I stream on Twitch, um, about three times a week. I also upload on the YouTube, which is probably where you're seeing this. Um, well, you, you you probably actually need to um, the uh, oh, so it's it's actually uh, just sysob underscore peach for Instagram. So s i s o b underscore peach. I'll link you to it as well. Um, but yeah. Uh, aside from that, man, thank you so much for uh, having me on. Cool. I hope to I I hope to do this again with you. But again, at with you some stage. <laughs> yeah, I, man, I think I think my verbiage meter has now just started to come to a close. Oh, yeah, he's drunk. Confirmed. Oh, not yet. <laughs> it's it's probably about two hours after I go red in the face like this, and that's yeah. if I keep on drinking. And also, I do have a date later, so um, fingers crossed for me. And also, uh, yeah, no, I need to stop drinking now. All right, guys. So please like and subscribe, or in twenty years' time, you'll look like Peach. I had to throw a dig at you somewhere. <laughs> I will end your life. I've heard you be described to smell like the colour yellow and medical grade cotton swabs. Oof! Actually, to be honest, that is so not true. Uh, <laughs> one of the one of the other things that I actually did was I I spent way too much money on like four different colognes from Myers. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a massive fan of smelling nice, looking nice most of the time. Didn't realize that you're like, oh yeah, man, stream me your webcam. I'm like, yeah. what? <laughs> See, I didn't, I didn't want you to get all like dressed up and like fake. See? See, I was already having a hard time getting him in Discord. So if I said to him, oh yeah, you're going to be on, you're going to be on like, on, on the video... He would have taken like two hours to put his makeup on, tease and tug his hair, and then start uh, working on his hair. You know what? My <laughs> hair actually is amazing as it is. Thank you. Um, and, and also, all I really would have probably done is just put a dress shirt on and a jacket because I don't need to worry about shoes. I don't need to worry about pants. Yeah. I'm wearing a dress shirt right now and I've got pajama bottoms on legitimately. <laughs> uh, well, if you've if you've ever seen any of my other um, uh, professional casting, I'm normally sitting there with like a one of my favourite shirts is like this dark blue shirt, and I've got a grey um, uh, blazer or suit that goes really nicely with it. I'll just be there, and I'll just be wearing shorts, <laughs> like e or even just like trunks, like trunks underwear because. Yeah, like how, how, unless I'm doing an intro or an outro in between commentary, um, yeah. then it's no issue. Anyway, sorry, I've derailed it again because I'm so good at that. It's fine, honestly. All right, my friend, I'll let you go. Again, guys, please like and subscribe to me or, you know, you'll wake up one day. <laughs> All right, uh, bye. If